Welcome to a new episode of Critter Snap. I'm Daniel Zurich. I'm a behavioral ecologist at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm David Duno. I'm evolutionary biologist at Cornell University. And I'm Alberto Lopez, and I'm a con conservation biologist from Puerto Rico. All right, and um, today uh, Alberto will talk about his experience in the Dominican Republic, where he went to uh, a couple of weeks ago on a conference, and he got to. Uh, uh, travel to field sites uh, to uh, um, where people do conservation re conservation research on amphibians and reptiles. What that conference also was about, and uh, I saw lots of cool animals. Uh, and uh, he's gonna tell us about what he learned there and well, what he already knows, I assume, but uh, but we don't. So go ahead, Alberto. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I was at this uh, meeting. It's a meet regional meeting for, for the Caribbean, and it's it was part of the Partners of Amphibian and Reptile Conservation um, group, and um, it was great meeting with collaborators from the Dominican Republic, and also meeting up with people from Puerto Rico. As I've told you guys before, um, I guess our audience may know, I'm currently not in Puerto Rico. I'm right now in Ithaca, New York. Um, so it was a great opportunity to meet up with all these people and um, think about things, future projects to work on, um, all towards the conservation of amphibians and reptiles of that region. Um, so it was in Dominican Republic. Um, I have a little map here for our audience here. This is basically in the Caribbean. Um, you could see Florida to your left top of the screen. Um, Dominican Republic is right in between Cuba to the left and then Puerto Rico to the right, which is that little small, beautiful mm -hmm. island right there. Um, I'm going to zoom in into Dominican Republic. Um, so Dominican Republic, this is basically part of the island of Hispaniola. Um, on our final day of the conference, we had a field trip um, to the southwest side of the island. Um, which was really great, and after that field trip, I got a. That's when I had an opportunity to visit um, different field sites where some of uh, my collaborators are working in with different uh, species of amphibians and reptiles, and and especially one. It was really interesting to see the habitat of one uh, threatened species of amphibian. Um, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit more um, because I want to talk about this small little island here which is right in the middle of this lake. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. So that is Lake Enriquillo, or known as Lago Enriquillo. Um, and right in the middle, you see this island, which is known as Isla Cabritos. And Isla Cabritos is a pretty cool and interesting place. Um, there is currently a conservation project to manage invasive species on this island. Um, because they're on this island, you can also find unique species that are very important and that are also critical, critically endangered, like species of rock iguanas, which I'm going to show you a picture real soon. So what are these uh, invasive species right there? Uh, well, on this island, um, you have cats, you have rats, you have mice, um, there are goats, there are donkeys, there are lots of animals donkeys. that were... Yeah, even donkeys that were brought over wow. to the island. And they all have um, different effects on the species that live on this island. Like donkeys, for example, you might think that they don't have, uh, they don't pose any neg negative effects to species, but they actually can because they change the terrain uh, on the island um, by just walking all over the place. And then cats, of course, cats are notoriously known for being very active predators. So... So they're actively right now trying to manage those invasive species on that island, and they gave us a tour basically of their project and what they were doing, um, all their efforts to be able to um, handle this situation and manage those species. Alberto, the donkeys are there because of the human. Yes, right. they are not naturally there. No, humans brought those. Yeah, they uh, brought there. But then, then they breed there and they just stay there? Exactly, yeah, they breed there, um, and, and people do use them, of course, to carry things oh, right. from one, one end of the island to the other, and they just stay there. Um, same thing with cats. People bring cats to the island, and they just reproduce, and there's tons of them there. Um, but they're, they're, I was very impressed with the work that they're doing, and, and it seems like they're doing a very good job of controlling the population of cats, and, and hopefully um, we'll see iguana populations starting to recover on, on the island. All right, so 
Nice fight guide. Yeah, big guy. This is a records iguana. Uh, records rock iguana. Iguanas are, are pretty cool animals. Um, they're uh, New World species. That means that you could only find them in the New World. Um, and this specific so genus... The Americas. In the Americas, yes. And, um, and this specific genus of iguanas, this is, the genus is known as Ciclura. Mm -hmm. um, so these are land iguanas. You, there are iguanas that spend lots of time on trees, for example, like green iguanas. That's probably one species of iguana that most of us know about. Um, they're, they're, they are sold in pet shops. Um, then there's the famous Galapagos iguana, which are marine iguanas, iguanas that swim very well. And then there's these guys, um, yeah, which he, are land iguanas. He doesn't look like he could climb a tree. <laughs> no, he, these guys do not climb trees very well. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why they're, they're threatened throughout their habitat. Like this, this genus of Ciclura, you could find them in different islands uh, along the Caribbean. And in all those islands where they are, they're basically threatened because um, they are basically easy, an easy catch for, for example, cats. Um, cats um, okay. basically... Make do havoc to their spe to this uh, particular species here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I assume that's only when they're juvenile. Right? Yes, when, when they're juveniles. That's basically when they're most vulnerable. Um, that's why lots of the programs that they've been doing to help the species recover, they basically um, they keep juveniles in enclosures, and then once they reach a certain size, then they release them out to the wild. So it's like an assisted um, release, basically. Um, okay. They don't keep them. Um, only till they get big enough. Um, and this species here, pretty cool. Um, it's one of the main char characteristics that you couldn't see to be able to identify the species here. Um, I don't know if you, you saw, you can see this red eye that it has right there. It's yeah. like blood red. Uh, it's, it's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. I actually also have pic like close-up pictures of just the eye because it is very striking um, and very cool. Um, so that's a very uh, good way to be able to identify the species if, if you go to East La Cabritos and to look for iguanas. Um, and, um, and another interesting aspect of its, uh, of its appearance is you could see under his jaws, um, lower jaw, you could see this bulging muscle right here. So these guys also have a pretty tight grip with those jaws. They have, it's, they're very strong, so you don't want to get bit by one of these guys. That's, that's a male, very, right? Uh, I believe so. This is a male, and that's very typical um, of, of this genus, this Splura uh, genus of iguanas. They have those big muscles under their jaws. Um, and this is, again, this is a critically endangered species, so it is very rare um, to find the species um, throughout the island. And the biggest populations of this particular species of iguanas is on this island in Isla Cabritas. And that's why it's being protected. All right. Yeah. Um, then, along, the, nice. so this is, <laughs> right now, I'm not, awesome. this is not in Isla Cabritas. This is on the shore of Lake Enriquillo. And this is another species of iguana, belongs to the same genus, um, Ciclura. This is known as a rhinoceros iguana. Anyone want to guess why it's known? <laughs> <laughs> why, why, yeah. why people call it a rhinoceros okay, iguana? We can see. Yeah, I wonder why. It looks like a dinosaur. It's awesome. Yeah, it is yeah. really cool. And, and they, they look like little dogs, basically. I mean, they're, they're pretty big. Um, I, don't, I but... don't know what dogs look like in Ithaca. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I don't know. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's me that I love reptiles. I, they, they seem cuter for me. Um, but but yeah so but they 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 are actually I guess they're used to being around people um, and and I do know they're this same genus of iguana is found in Puerto Rico uh, only on a small island in Puerto Rico and they also they're the, the iguanas that are in the camping grounds they are not scared of humans at all but as as you move farther away from the camping grounds they are very skittish and they don't mm -hmm. let you get close to them but this guy yeah. fortunately as you can see i was able to get pretty close to him yeah i, w I was uh, i was about to ask like just from a foot photography standpoint like how how close did you have to get uh, to um, to take pictures of these guys and and I know you took a bunch of like photo gear with you so what what did you how did you get yeah. that shot yeah that, I mean just doing that making that decision of what photo gear to take was really tough um, but I ended up taking both a micro four-thirds camera 
um, only with a macro lens, nothing else. And mm -hmm. I took uh, my DSLR with a telephoto lens with the 100 to 400 version two, Mark II, and um, with a macro lens also. Um, and this was taken with a micro four thirds camera, and I was only about a foot away from this igu iguana, so he had no problem with me being so close to him, fortunately. Well, I don't know, really, according to his expression, he was not very happy. <laughs> he was he was he was just yawning. He was he wasn't right. screaming or being mad. Um, he was just yawning. I guess he was tired of me. May maybe. I guess. <laughs> um, and and this was taken with a macro lens. This was taken with a, a Olympus sixty millimeter two point eight uh, macro lens. So it was it was great being able to take this shot like easy handheld like with a small camera. Um, so th so it was great. It was great to see this yeah. guy so close. That, that was with your your wife's Olympus, right? Yes, it, it is with my wife's <laughs> Olympus your camera, which I which I borrow because mm -hmm. she doesn't use it as much. So I just borrow it once in a while. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Next picture. This is a curly-tailed lizard. Wow. Um, yeah. Pretty cool guy, yeah. yeah. Um, very impressive. There's there are multiple species of curly tail tail lizards in the Dominican Republic. I have to say this was my favorite one. This is to me the, the most beautiful one I saw. Um, mm -hmm. And these guys are very skittish. Like I could not get close to to this guy right here. Um, uh, that's 60 millimeters for a macro lens. Um, on micro four thirds, which would make it about 120 millimeters, was not enough. I could not mm. get close at all. So this is where this new lens that I got, I felt great. I made a good investment. Uh, that's <laughs> that's the, what I tell myself. That's the um, Canon 100 to 400 Mark II that that you talked yep. about in our first episode, I yes, believe, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, right. And well, money, money well spent. Exactly, money well spent. That's how I like to mm -hmm. think. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, because that photo is gonna make you rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, I don't think so. But at least, it, yeah, it's a good picture. It's a good picture. I, I was really, really, really happy with the experience of having that yeah. lens. So you take said pictures you, of animals like this. What was that, David? Curly tailed. It's a curly tail, but actually Why? quite interesting. So, so curly tailed lizards, well, they're known because they curl their tails up, um, but not all of them do. And I believe this species is one of those examples that they actually can't curl their their tails all the way up in a in a nice little curl. Um, that, but that's, that's why they're known. Yeah, that's why do they do yeah. that? Why would they do that? Uh, I have no idea. You know, it, it's you know? it's it, it, yeah, it's something you know that well, I, I wonder about. Uh, Lots of lizards have these courtship displays where the, the males will do mm -hmm. a tail flick to uh, attract the attention of the female, and then uh, she she looks at him and evaluates if he's a good enough mate, and so on. That's pretty common in lots of lizards. Yeah, I, I don't know could, if the, I don't know yeah, if that yeah. is related to like a tail flicking behavior. Yeah, possibly. I mean, something that I guess I'd like to share also that I don't know much about the biology of these species um, because this whole genus of curly tailed lizards, which is Leicephalus, um you cannot find them in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is right, right next to Dominican Republic, but we don't share all the species. We do have lots of species in common, um, but they, these guys right here, we do not have in Puerto Rico. So mm. for me, having an opportunity to take a picture of them was really exciting because this is something that I don't usually get a chance to see. So mm. it was it was great. I mean, this is the first time I saw uh, this particular species of curly-tailed lizard. And this Great. you found it on the on the island of your or when you moved out of the island? Where did this you take is, the picture? This is along the shore of Lake Enriquillo. So this is I went on a boat all the way into the island and then when we came back, exactly when I got off the boat, I found this guy. Um, and I started taking pictures of him oh, in it. Right. And everyone right. in the group was rushing me, Hey, we have to go and I was like, No <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to spend more time taking pictures. Oh, so all right. yeah. Awesome, awesome uh, lizard. Very, very beautiful. Um, then, um, after, I guess, all our uh, morning and afternoon events and trips, um, they gave us a tour of the island, then we came back. And then um, I met up with one of my collaborators in Dominican Republic, um, which was amazing. Um, if you ever go to Dominican Republic, I would recommend hiring a guide, um, which in this case, he was my collaborator, and he took me to all these different places. He took me um, to one of the locations where he's doing um, 
this research project that we're collaborating in. And, um, and I guess we saw the species that he's working with, but we also saw other amazing species, like this species right here, the pointed that's, snake. That's ringing a bell of when I went to Puerto Rico with you, right? Exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, so this is another species uh, that we do not have in Puerto Rico. This, is a, this whole genus is not present in Puerto Rico. It's uh, Euromasser, and um, they're all very slender snakes um, and very amazing, beautiful, bright green. And the, in this case, this yeah. is the pointed snake. Again, why, I bet you guys know why it's called the pointed snake. It's pretty clear and apparent. Mm -hmm. Um, I know, yeah. and and these guys may, mainly eat. Um, uh, they spend their time in the canopy and trees, and um, they love eating lizards. Um, for example, they're not very big animals, so they're not. They don't. Um, uh, they don't go are after they, big prey items. Are they venomous at all? They are not venomous. No, they're actually uh, very uh, uh, docile to handhold and, and be able to hold one. Which I definitely, oh. uh, of course, I could not take a selfie of myself holding the snake, but I'm not going to share yeah. that picture. Let's, <laughs> yeah, let's, so. let's not get into that territory. <laughs> <laughs> yes, herpetologists take sel selfies of themselves um, with animals. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I, I will not know. show any of those pictures. Um, <laughs> But I do have a picture of another animal right here, um, another reptile. Um, this is an anole, um, and I believe the common name of this anole is the Haitian giant anole. I, I did spend, I, since I was on the southwest side of the island, I was very close to the border with Haiti. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this anole, very cool species. It's a giant anole. They're very big, um, big lizard. And um, big. Well... Because compared to the iguana, I guess it's small. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. But when we talk about anoles and, and that specific family of lizards, uh -huh. um, he this guy would be considered a pretty big guy. Um, they, um, And I'll show you something that's also pretty cool, this picture right here. You still haven't given us the, the actual size. Oh, the sorry, the actual size of this guy <laughs> um, with tail Spin and everything. Out. Yeah, with tail and everything, a little bit yeah. more than a foot long. Okay. Mm. With, with including tail, um, in usually, uh, for example, in Puerto Rico, most of the lizards are I don't know, like six inches long, six to eight inches. These guys, when they're adults, they grow a foot long or more um, with their tails, and um, they actually eat other lizards, which is pretty cool too. Huh. Um, they're that okay. big that they they do that frequently, wow. um, and um, and. This picture that I have right here, so that's a close-up of, of his claws. Um, it was nice. just a great opportunity to take a picture of... And, and it gives us me a great opportunity to explain the concept of ecomorph. So, so this guy right here, he spends most of his time in the canopy. So he's known as a canopy ecomorph. And to live up on those in those trees up in the canopy you have to have some adaptations to be able to live there and one of those adaptations that this species has is those giant claws I mean especially mm -hmm. when you compare it to other anoles um, this guy has very impressive claws and also those toe pads they are ideal to be high up in the canopy yeah so those uh, toe pads there they look like they're like pretty much like what geckos have. So they have these uh, really small hairs that will help them attach to different surfaces. Uh, it's a concept that yeah, insects, uh, reptiles. It's it's pretty. It's not uncommon in in the animal kingdom mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that you have that, and they do that by maximizing contact with the surface with all these little spoon shaped uh, yeah. hairs uh, that that form these patches. Yeah. Something yeah. I did my master's thesis on, in case you guys didn't know that. Oh, I did not yeah. know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, in insects, though. So. so moving on, next picture I have here. It's a species of frog that actually, I'm sorry, a toad, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and it's um, it's it's kind of it has this this feeling of that. Um, so it's all, so in the Dominican Republic, this is the genus of this frog is Peltofrine, and um, this in Puerto Rico we also have a, a toad from that same genus, and it's a critically endangered species. You can only find it in this small patch of forest on the southwest side of the island. The only place where you can find it, and that forest is protected. So 
this is where my collaborator he took a he took me to his field site one of his field sites and he works with the, this genus of frogs and I was thinking that he when he told me that oh I'm gonna take you to the habitat of the peltophrenes of the of these frogs um, and I was expecting something like secluded and with no houses around and then we basically go to the small urban area or rural area actually but with houses all over the place and these frogs were calling all over the place in gutters basically like <laughs> nothing very protected like just along roads and it was very impressive actually I mean it, it made me feel that this is probably something that you could probably see in Puerto Rico a hundred years ago and you would have all these frogs all over the place and people actually th still think that these frogs all are all over the place in Puerto Rico, but the sad part is that they actually aren't. Um, the frog that really is in Puerto Rico right now, all over the place, is the cane toad, which is an <laughs> invasive species. And people God. think yeah. that they're that same frog, but no, they're the cane toad. So, so that I mean, that right there is one of the many impacts that invasive species have. People think, oh, that that. In Puerto Rico, we would call these frog, these toads, sapo concho. So you you hear people in Puerto Rico saying, "Oh, sapo conchos, they're doing just fine. I have ten of them in my yard, and they're oh. really cane toads." Oh so, God, yeah, that's sad. Yeah, and, but but seeing this frog in the Dominican Republic, um, and it's actually threatened in the Dominican Republic too. So I, I really hope that the, the same story doesn't happen in Dominican Republic. But it, it was a very amazing experience to see all these frogs all around the place just calling. It was pretty cool. You know, if in Puerto Rico it's more the, the fact that they disappeared in the garden is because of um, uh, habitat destruction or yes. because of the canto that actually replaced, so species replacement. You know, it, it, it is... Uh, it was probably um, habitat destruction in Puerto Rico. I mean, at one point, it was about 90 per, above 95 percent of the island was deforested. So habitat destruction um, was, had great impact, not only on the cane toad, but with other species like the Puerto Rican parrot, which also was found all around the island and now also can only be found in a small patch of protected forest on the island. Mm. Um, and right now they're trying to breed them in different places. So it was mainly habitat destruction. And of course, I mean, now, now the big problem is that they're trying to do reintroductions of this toad, the endangered toad in Puerto Rico, but now they actually have to compete with the invasive toads. So now that is definitely an issue that... Uh, that uh, conservation biologists are working on and, and trying to figure that out. Um, <laughs> next picture, um, this li little guy over here, I mean, I say it's little, you might not think it, he's a little guy based on this the, picture, it's a macro picture. The depth picture. of field kind of gives it away that it has to be yeah. very small. Yeah, yeah, it was it was really tough taking a picture of this guy. This is a, a small gecko from the genus Spherodactylus. Um, and this genus is known, I mean, these geckos are really, really tiny. Um, actually, at one point, a member, a gecko of this genus, held the record for the smallest vertebrae, vertebrae in the world. Um, I think right now that uh, the animal that holds that record is either a frog or a chameleon. Um, mm -hmm. But at one point, they used to hold that record. So they are so, really, really tiny. And they're, so how, they, big, how big was this guy? It was like, like a few millimeters? Um, this guy, I will, I will say it in inches. It's about, uh, about an inch and a half, maybe. But that's with tail. I uh, no, actually, that, about snout vent, length, snout vent length, which is from the tip of the snout um, to the cloaca. <laughs> That's All usually right. when, when scientists say that, it's SBL. Um, tail and everything, oh, yeah. and everything maybe close to two inches, I would Already say. Already something learned today. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. That's what SBL right. means. Um, okay. okay. And then... This picture here, it's not a reptile, it's ah, not an amphibian. That's the idea, right? Yeah, yeah. I just oh, wanted man. to put it because it, this was like, it was scary. So, I mean, my collaborator, uh, uh, he took me to, you know, different places. Then he took me to this one forest and um, it was insane. You would find, I mean, I saw so many of these centipedes everywhere. They were everywhere, just crawling around. And I remember when I got there, I put my backpack on the floor um, to look for, you know, reptiles under rocks and stuff. 
And then after seeing so <laughs> many of them everywhere, I'm like, okay. no, I, I guess I'm not going to put my well, backpack yeah. on the floor and, anymore. And we, we should say, so we're yeah, all not we particularly, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we're all not particularly skittish uh, in terms of animals. I mean, I work with, with spiders and some of those are, are pretty venomous, but these scholar panda uh, centipedes, they freak me out. They're they're so big. They're horrifically venomous um, and uh, and aggressive. And some of them eat bats. And uh, yeah, mm. they, you, they're no joke. Yeah, yeah, no. France, so, actually, in France, we have them. They are not that big. They're about that big. But that's probably the only um, only animal, maybe you have, beside the spiders, that can kill uh, humans. So you can have a uh, maybe some what, black what widow. Spider, and, what spider and in France can kill a human? Black widow. We have apparently some black widow in the south sometimes. It's very rare. Yeah, black widows aren't that bad. Ah, okay. So you are saying so well. Uh, so they don't really, yeah, they really, like spiders are, like even the worst spiders are not nearly as bad as, uh, as many uh, other venomous animals. And well, of course we also have uh, uh, some, some vipers. But otherwise, mm. this is actually the thing that is the most dangerous. So we don't have so many, but at least... Yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, this guy, it's, they're just so mean. I mean, they actively hunt. These are insects that actively hunt. Like, we were watching them going into every little small crevice, every small little hole on the ground, mm. searching for an animal to eat, okay? So they are, yeah. like, pure hunters. They're not insects. <laughs> they, 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 they do not they do not do sit and wait like they do not just sit for mm -hmm. prey to come to them no they actively go out hunting and it was super i mean this this picture right here it's not a great picture i did not try to take any great pictures of this guy <laughs> because um my, my collaborator said you know um uh, because i had a, a, another uh friend was there with us and he was filming it with a gopro and he said, oh, yeah, and, and these guys are actually known for jumping, too. I think he was only joking <laughs> just to freak us out even more. <laughs> but, yeah, but it was like I, I just didn't want to get any closer. And, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, we have these guys in Puerto Rico, and they grow. I mean, they, they get pretty big in Puerto Rico, close to a foot, um, but they, they're not too, like, big and bulky. This guy was a little bit more, a little bit more than a foot long, and they were, like, so big. Like, it mm -hmm. was very impressive. And that's it. I don't even want to watch this picture. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Move on. Um, going to something that looks much more cuddly, um, it, I wanted to throw in there a picture of a bird. Mm -hmm. This is a, a toady, a uh, broad-billed toady. Um, the, that genus of birds, toadies, um, um, that you can only find them in the Caribbean region. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty cool reason. If you want to see this bird, you have to get on a plane and go to what uh, you have to go to one of the greater Antilles, that is Jamaica, Cuba, mm -hmm. Dominican Republic, Hispaniola, um, or Puerto Rico to see a toady. Yeah. Um, well, what, what, and, you, what you don't see in this picture is that there's a centipede just hiding outside of the frame that ended this bird's <laughs> life a, a second probably, later. <laughs> probably, yeah. The, and this, this bird is like really tiny, very cool, um, and they're pretty common. Fortunately, I had very bad lighting. I saw them like right at the end of the day, uh, but still, I couldn't resist. I needed to take a picture of it. Um, I it's do have gorgeous. pictures of the local species in Puerto Rico, um, but I definitely wanted to take a picture of the one, one of mm -hmm. the two species that are found in Dominican Republic. In Puerto yeah. Rico, there's just one. The Dominican Republic has two. So, yeah. Yeah, actually, it actually looks a lot like those uh, jumping spiders I'm working with right now. They have oh, yeah? like a red face. Uh, green surroundings, yellow legs. Kind of sure. Monster. Yeah, that's know. how, I've, just I've like I say that iguanas look like dogs, now you're turning spiders, it, exactly. birds into yeah. spiders. I've, I spent way too much time looking at these spiders, so <laughs> <laughs> don't and out, I don't get out very much. Look, to make you happy, I thought, Yay! how can, I, how can right. I not take a picture of a jumping spider with Daniel? You know, I needed to take one, so mm -hmm. um, this is a jumping spider, SP. I have no idea what species it is. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome species. I mean, well, it was metallic blue colors. Yeah, it looks pretty. It looks like a baby, but, uh, or, yeah, no, like kind of juvenile-ish. I have no idea what species that is. Uh, maybe, uh, there, well, there are lots of jumping spider species out there that we that are just not described, that we know exist, but they haven't been formally described, like even in North America. Uh, 
I found a new species in my lab. I collected it and I was a juvenile and it just turned into an adult of like a unknown undescribed species that just has a code name. So that happens all the time with these animals. Oh. Yeah, I mean, when I was taking this picture, um, it, my friend told me, yeah, I mean, who knows? This might even be a new, uh, new species. That and In Dominican yeah. Republic, unfortunately, um, there's a lack of knowledge uh, of, of many of the species that mm. are present on the island. I mean, they're still yeah. discovering new species to this day. I bet. Um, so, so I mean, we need uh, more biologists to go there. Jumping, jumping spiders are the biggest family of spiders. Uh, worldwide, and they live everywhere. So that's they're like a bottomless uh, source of uh, of joy. Interesting. Will you get yeah. to name yours? Hmm? Will you get to describe the name yours? You want I don't find? know. I'm I'm not really a taxonomist. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not going out to try to find new species and name them. There's other people who are much more qualified so uh, what about that. Yours? Um, well, that's probably a good topic for a different episode, like where it's just going to be all about jumping spiders. Uh, I research uh, the, the physiology of their vision, because they see really well, but that's... You know what I, I mean, that you discovered yeah. a new species, so do you, do you think oh. that you're going to do something with it? Or? Oh, oh no, I didn't discover it. I just taxonomy. saw it, and I uh, and I asked someone who knows uh, Wayne Madison, who is like the, uh, one of the leading uh, jumping spider taxonomists, and he said like, oh cool, that is... Uh, the code name Sun Glow, which uh, oh, yeah, which uh, and, and that one that I found is well, I that that I found in my lab, is um, it's going to be the type specimen for that species now. Okay. So well, we'll see what comes yeah. up. All right. Awesome. So uh, I think That's we're out of time. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was awesome. Right, and really uh, nice. yeah. So, so now we all we all should go there. Yeah, yeah. if you go to the Republic, <laughs> definitely you will get to see lots of awesome things. And like I, and I would actually recommend if you go to any place like this, if you have a guide, it will be so much easier. You will be able to find things and your, your time will be well spent. I only did basically about one day and I, I was able to see all that stuff and m much more things. So, uh, so about just one last question. Uh, you said it's good to hire a guide. Um, obviously, we like people like us. We have connections to scientists who are like happy to show off their field sites. But uh, do you have any uh, tips for someone who just wants to go down there and experience uh, nature and so on? What they should do? Like, how would they hire a guide? Uh, to Dominican Republic? Yeah. Oh well, I could. Well, my collaborator is also a guide. <laughs> he <laughs> he he is a scientist, but he also. Um, works at being a guide and he, he, he takes people to see birds and, and, and to do photography and his name is Miguel Landestoy. I guess put a reference on the yeah totally okay. yeah yeah, yeah. I will totally, okay. I'll, I'll I've, put I've a link uh, uh, also in the in the yeah in yeah the and you uh, just google him that's and, below. And, and I think I think you'll find you'll find his contact information. Or if anyone has a question, just write a comment, and I could pass you his contact information. And believe me, he is an awesome guide, um, awesome scientist, awesome person, excellent photographer, um, and you'll have a blast. So. Okay. Wow, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, so that does it for our episode today. I hope you liked it, and uh, whether you did or didn't, if you have any comments, then please uh, let us know in the, uh, in the comment section or uh, on Twitter at CritterSnap. And, uh, and that's it. So uh, for David, Alberto, and myself, um, thanks for watching. All right. See you Bye. guys. Bye. Bye.